Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyams, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs, and this is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps us up at night. And what powers that mission is people. And Here to Help is a look at how people's experience, strength, and hope inspires them to want to help others. At Indeed, we believe that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. So last year, we launched a new program called Rising Voices. The idea was simple. Instead of spending a million dollars on a TV commercial, what if instead we invested $1 million in 10 underrepresented filmmakers to produce their own short films about the meaning of work? And today, I'm very excited to introduce you all to one of those Rising Voices. Gabriela Ortega is an award-winning writer, director, and actor born in the Dominican Republic. She is a graduate of the University of Southern California, a 2021-2022 Sundance Institute Art of Practice Fellow, and currently is based in Los Angeles. And her film, Wea, was produced as part of Rising Voices. Wea tells the story of a disenchanted flamenco dancer resigned to a desk job whose life is upended after the death of her grandmother unleashes a generational curse. It's an incredibly powerful and beautiful film and testament to Gabriela's boundless talent. I'm delighted to say that Wea is currently being screened at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival, and Gabriela is developing it into a feature film. And I'm also delighted to say that Indeed has selected three filmmakers from season one of Rising Voices to act as filmmakers in residence as part of our new development lab, where Gabriella will receive $100,000 to develop new stories in conjunction with Indeed, Lena Waithe's Helmingrad Productions, and our partner 271 Films. Gabriella, thank you so much for joining me today, and congratulations on Sundance. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. And thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> I'm sorry it was long, but there's just so much uh, really to pack in there, and we have we have some time, and so we're going to dive into all that. But before we do, for the folks that haven't had a chance to see Wea, we're going to run a very short trailer just to give you a taste of what's to come. I love that. Um, it's such an amazing film. I'm so excited for people to get a chance to see it. But let's start where we always start these discussions by asking, how are you doing today, right now? I'm good. I had a really great weekend um, connecting with actually a friend from the Dominican Republic that came to visit me. And it was really nice to have a, a bit of home in L.A. while all of this is happening. So uh, I was I feel recharged and excited to take on the week. How are you? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm doing great. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm so excited for the success that you and uh, so many of the other participants in Rising Voices has had. I'm excited about season two of Rising Voices. So we're going to talk about a, a bunch of this. And and in particular, I, I definitely want to spend some time talking about Wea. But let's start by just talking about this experience of being at Sundance. It's the dream pretty much, I think, of every filmmaker to get a film into Sundance. And then of course, this is the middle of a pandemic. And so that festival experience is maybe different than it might've been imagined. You're not in Park City, you were at home doing Zoom and, and other things, but talk about that experience and what, what Sundance is, has meant to you. Well, you know, the funny thing is my first Sundance ever. And I think after everything that's already been going on with the film, which has been obviously through Indeed, I feel like it almost was like a, a gift to be able to go to Sundance and a testament of all the hard work of everyone involved in the film that, you know, even after it had premiered already, it still got into the festival. Those relationships with the Sundance Institute, I feel like I've developed over time. They've been a great, like amazing supporters of my work as well um, in different practices. So it does feel like a bit of a graduation um, of this whole year that I, I feel like this whole year I was at grad school because I, I didn't go to film school. 
And then having rising voices be sort of like these thesis of like life, you know, and then to be able to graduate into Sundance has been amazing. Um, and the beauty about virtual is that people from all over the world can watch the film. And I think that's something that even with the Rising Voices program, you always intended to, to have as many eyes on the film as possible. So anything in any capacity um, really is great, you know, that my friends back home can watch it too. And again, I, I'll make the most out of any experience. And if this is the virtual Sundance, then I'm, I'm going to rock it, you know? So I, I am very, very grateful and, and, and excited to, to be there and, and to just soak up all this film, you know? Um, so let's let's back up a little bit. You were born in the Dominican Republic. You moved to the U.S. when you were 17. Um, can you talk a little bit about growing up in the DR and what inspired you to come to the U.S.? Totally. So I grew up in Santo Domingo. Both my parents work and always sort of instilling me how to like work hard for your for what you want. And but they have nothing to do with the arts at all. Actually, nobody in my family. Uh, my dad's a dentist. My mom's a lawyer. But I grew up. I like to call it like I grew up in a matriarchy, just because my grandma had four daughters and my mom had two, and so and they were all sort of very strong opinionated women so I I did I feel like very blessed that I grew up thinking that you know you can do anything if you work hard I never thought about like gender to be a limitation or, or like the color of my skin or anything of that I, I felt very very empowered to to chase and, and work hard for what I wanted um, but in school from a very early age I think I just gravitated towards creativity and the arts I, I drew when I was really young and I did theater and all this stuff. Um, I grew up in the theater pretty much. And through that, I think I realized that I, I wanted to be an actor. I love performing. I actually love doing musical theater, but um, turns out I can't dance, even though, <laughs> even though my film has a lot of dance in it. I have rhythm, but not like, you know, uh, but Quickly, so I, I understood that to do that and to really fulfill that potential when I was in high school, I realized, oh, there's a way to do this, but I have to go to the U.S. and you can study this thing called acting, you know, and and I I worked really, really hard to, to, to get a scholarship and to get um, financial aid to be able to, you know, afford to, to move here and, well, and to do it, you know, and when I applied to college blindly, they don't tell you this, but when you're doing performing arts, you have to audition for all these programs. So kids audition for like 10 to 12 schools, hoping one of them would pick them. Um, and I got rejected by a lot of places, but USC said yes to me. I had never been to California, um, but they gave me money and said yes. And I was like, hey, I guess I'm moving to the other half of the world. Um, and so that, that's what actually brought me here. But then in school, then I started developing other interests outside of acting. And that's when writing came in and then eventually led me to direct. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, transition? So starting out as a performer, what, what was it that drew you to wanting to be behind the camera and maybe has it changed the way that you approach being a filmmaker, having been on the other side as an actor, and does that bring something different to your perspective? 100%. I actually think it's such a blessing that I didn't go to film school. Fun fact, I had to do work study in college and I worked at the cinema library. So I was surrounded by all the film kids all the time and they would like rent all these like Alfred Hitchcock uh, books or like want to see all the like Paul Thomas Anderson movies and the original like DVDs or whatever. <laughs> so that was funny. I worked there for two years uh, and it was it was great. When I moved here, I had this idea of myself, right? Of I could do anything and, and I can, you know, I can fit. I'll, I'll fit in this industry. But, you know, you quickly realize when you're here that there's so much more to just the art component of it. There's the whole business component. Um, there's the, the politics of it all. And I found that in 2013, when I moved to this country, the conversation around sort of the depictions of Latinx characters in media was starting to change, but it wasn't where it's starting to go right now, you know? Um, 
And I found myself auditioning and, and, and even in school doing some plays and, and, and stuff that though I, again, I, I was so excited about because I'd never sort of had that exposure or that capacity or even that attention put on myself in this program. I still didn't feel like I was exploring like my authentic self through the work and so much more. So when, when I graduated, I found that so much of what people wanted was that authenticity, like, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And, and I just felt really lost that first year of school because I felt like I, I had to change. Like I was even told by someone that I had to change my accent because I, it was like thicker when I moved and really stuff that, that made me shrink a little bit. But when I was a sophomore in college, um, they had this guest director who I'll tie back to Wea in a second, but this woman, her name is Denise Blasor, and she's a Puerto Rican actor, director, just an amazing person. And she was directing this play called Anna in the Tropics. And it was the the first play about Latino characters, I think, that won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and I auditioned for that play. I got the lead. And I worked so hard. And it was the first time in my life that I was being embraced by who I was, you know? And, and all the stuff that I had, like, to sort of learn that first year of college she as a director was like no no no, I want you to lean into your accent I want you to be who you are and so that really changed my life and and it's it's the power of mentorship too you know the power of just having someone in your corner and the power of like representation like she she was Caribbean so she she really pushed me to be um myself and then through that I was like I can't settle for less so I started writing for myself and when I was 19 (laughs) which was wild. I put on a one-woman show called Las Garcia. um, And I got a professor that was, uh, his name is Phil Allen. He's my voiceover mentor and just like a wonderful human. He like really rallied behind me to to produce this thing, got me with a stage manager, and I put it up at the Hollywood Fringe. And the show was about 1960s Dominican Republic and a bit of my family history with that, like post-dictatorship. And it was a like this romance thing. It was like so much fun. And and it, we so I <laughs> I lied about my age to be able to get into the festival because I wasn't old enough. And I produced it myself. I did all the graphics, every everything. And I was posting on social media. And miraculously, it 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 sold out. People showed up. I don't know. And and we got nominated for best solo show. It was this whole thing. And again, it was about going in and I would rehearse like they would let me in in school in the summer to like rehearse in the rehearsal rooms at USC and you know we weren't supposed to but they were like letting me it was like crazy um but since and then then that was like okay now I can't really settle for less because this is the most amazing experience I've ever had and so that led me to continue to 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 go into film because I wanted more people to be able to see the things that I was doing because in theater you know it's so magical I'll always go back to the theater but film it can really reach anyone because you can just send someone the link or or you can post it somewhere online so I made a short in the DR with some friends like I rallied all my favors that you could imagine and it was three of us I wrote and produced and I was in it as well and then my two other friends one directed one produced and when that was done that was about um sort of talking about um machismo and sort of like how to create a society that's a little more um, inclusive of and, 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 and kind of talking about microaggressions. So it was really cool because we talked about a topic that wasn't really talked about as much in Dominican Republic. And we, we created screenings for people to come and have conversations. And we had a, an art installation. It was like a really cool social social experiment in a way. We, we, we really started like a, a really great conversation back home but then, and that was 2017. And then by the end of that journey, I was like, I, f- I felt really proud of what we made, but I also felt like, huh, I had some very specific ideas while I was writing that I wish I would have done. And then I realized, oh, that's the director's job. So maybe I want to direct. And Again, it's, it's been a very intuitive journey of just going for it. Because to me, 
even if I don't know how to do something, I'll either volunteer where someone's doing it and learn. I'll absorb. I'll look on. You know, I'm just very much like that. Like I'm, I, I just want to, if I want to do something, I find a way to make it work. Um, and so I came back to the U.S. and I had a mutual friend that, you know, he was doing a lot of commercial work and he's a d- director of photography and had a very good camera. And his name's Kenzo, one of my creative partners and, and friends of life. Um, but he was, he wanted to try doing stuff that was a little more experimental. And so I was like, Hey, let's do some crazy stuff. I, I will, don't pay me. I just want to try and I just want to create stuff. And so through that, we started building a relationship and we did a, a longer project that is, is still in post because it's so hard to finish, you know, movies. But th- then after that, we started just working together on like poetry films or like, little experimental shorts and, and a music video. And, and that sort of gave me the opportunity to, to grow as a director. Um, and But, you know, I still wanted to have something that was very honest. And so by the end of that whole journey, right before the pandemic, actually, the beginning of 2020, I was back home with my dad in Dominican Republic. And I realized I hadn't made anything that, felt like it was Dominican or or, or really mine um and then I we would go on road trips together me and my dad have a very close bond and we would go do this thing called overlanding which is when you take a four by four and you just drive through the beach like a, a crazy person truly just like um and and you end up in these beautiful sites but it takes like a while to like the the road less traveled by quite literally um so me and my dad would do all these trips and go camping and stuff and I just started documenting it with my phone and by the by the end of that those that trip that I was there for the Christmas holidays of 2019-2020 I had all this footage of me and my dad going to all these amazing places and when the pandemic hit, actually, that's when I was like, hey, I you've been wanting to do something very personal for a while. Why don't I make something out of this? And I grab a friend. Again, it's all like friends that come into the fold and, and, and they can't do this alone. And we edited like the March, basically, when we were like full on lockdown. Mm-hmm. And by the end of that, I had this small film called Papi that I made with my phone that I was super proud of. And I spent $300 total in that film because I got a friend to also do the sound for it. And then I got into like eight film festivals that year in 2020. And November of that year, I got a call from HBO that they wanted to acquire it and license it. And now it's going to premiere this summer in, in, in July for Father's Day. And so long journey, long story short, I think what's, what sort of led me to end up then having all this portfolio and applying to rising voices and sort of having, having now been to Sundance and and have this journey of, of directing. I think it's, it's quite literally trusting the process and, you know, meeting people along the way that I could learn from and being open to, to life changing and, life's surprises and that sometimes you start somewhere but you don't have to end up there you know um and as an actor I think my eye has it has shaped my eye as a director because I want to be a director that actors want to work with you know that I would want to work with and that I would want to support um while also being super inspired by other practices that aren't necessarily filmmaking you know because I, I didn't grow up being a cinephile I I get inspired by music or um, painting or poetry and so it's been really beautiful to sort of be embraced by that and find my own tribe of, of people that that would go and trust that I could you know usher like usher this this project on you know and so I, I feel very lucky for sure and, and very aware of the privilege that it is to be an artist but I think it's just been a lot of hard work and being kind to people and, 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 and collaborating with people. And so, yeah, it's, it's 
as you've heard, it's, it's long, but it's, I think it's a good story. But it's an amazing story in particular, because I mean, I think that, and, and, um, I don't know how true this is, but I, I, I do, you know, I seem to know people who have such a clear idea of this is where I want to get to in my future. And these are the steps and this is what I'm doing. This is my 10 year plan. And then there's everyone else. And your story is, and, and, and my career has also just been, there are things that I'm interested in and I'm interested in so many things. And I just sort of, there was no way 30 years ago to, to imagine where you might end up. But like when you tell that story, it's a very logical story, how one thing led to the other. And it was all about outlets for creativity and how you could get your vision into some format that people can actually uh, experience it. So I, it's a it's a beautiful story. Um, well, I'd, I'd love to to then talk about Rising Voices. So you'd done all of this work that really got you ready for this opportunity and um, for folks that maybe don't know too much about it, can you talk a little bit about how, how did you first hear about Rising Voices and what was the process like for you of finding out about this thing and deciding what you wanted to do with it? So in that process of becoming a director, I made it a point to apply to everything. Um, like you name it, I put alerts on my phone in certain places on Instagram that I felt like posted about opportunities for women, BIPOC directors, directors at large, anything, anything I would apply to it. And it started in 2020 and I got like more than a hundred rejections. I kid you not throughout like the two years I was doing this, but I think the, in the, kind of coming back to it and trying again and revising these materials and, and these projects and these scripts kind of made me a better artist and a better writer. And by the time that Rising Voices popped up, I think I saw it on a, one of the trades and Lena's face was in it. And I know that when Lena's face is somewhere, it's because something cool is going to happen. I've been a big fan of Lena Waithe. And so I read about it. And to be honest with you, I was like, $100,000 for, for, for everyone. Like what? I just didn't, you know, it's, it was kind of tricky because I was like, nah, <laughs> you know, it's always like $5,000, you know, there's a lot of preparation that has come to this. And, and I also want to say like, while all this is happening, I'm, I'm also like having a day job, you know, and, and like doing all these, like you're like juggling 10,000 things and like going to bed late and like cramming something in, you know, specifically for Weya, I wrote it in the pandemic, right way before Rising Voices. I had the idea, the first image that came to my mind was I think a dream or something. I don't remember, but it was this f image of, of a chain of women supporting sort of like like a picture of women looking like a serpent because they were all sort of holding each other. And it felt like generations of women holding each other. And it felt like mythical to me. And I was like, what, what is this image that I have in my head? Or what, what can I do with it? And so I started kind of brainstorming. And I wrote a treatment of this woman working at an office and wanting to quit her job but being pulled back by these ancestors sort of giving her strength. And that was like the first seed of, of Huella. And then I was very inspired by those images. So I, I like created this like lookbook with images and like inspiration ideas. And then I wrote a first version of the script. It just like poured out of me. And it was, again, the summer of 2020. I was, we weren't shooting, you know, still. You know, it's, I, I, I just, I was like, I'm going to shelve this. This is going to live in my... I don't know, Google Drive for now. And I sent it to my producers that I work with and, and they were like, I love it, blah, blah, blah. It's so ambitious. <laughs> so I, I, I just shelved the project. And then I, I focused actually on two feature, like uh, this feature film that I had been wanting to make. Um, and I started applying for grants for that. So I, my heart and head weren't in Weya at all for most of 2020. And then... When rising, like when I started seeing, because the window was, you you all were sneaky. The window was like three weeks long. And I see this and I was like, oh, I don't know what am I going to apply with? Like, I don't know. And then I had an alert the day that it was due. And I was like, oh my God, I have to send something. And at first I, I was like, 
I don't have anything. And then I remember, oh, I have that short way yeah, that I hadn't even touched. And it was a little bit too long. So I just like couldn't, like I just did a little Frankenstein work. <laughs> and then I sent all my, I had all these things that I had done in 2020 because I, 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 I worked with my friend Kenzo. So I sent my portfolio, I sent the piece about my dad. And then the questions were very straightforward. And I think, again, I had wrote so, I had worked for like a year and a half on these like artist statements and, and what do I believe in and what does this mean to me that by the time I was answering these questions, they were just like, I was clear, you know, of, of, of what I wanted to say. And I think that really helped. And then I sent it literally like two hours before the deadline closed. And I think it was like two weeks later or something. I got an email that I got an interview back and then, and I still couldn't believe, <laughs> I think there's a video of me crying somewhere, but, um, and then I got in, you know, and it was, it's crazy how when you're sort of focused on, on yourself and, and creating and, and coming from a place of creativity and not just like comparing yourself to others, you kind of do so much work that it prepares you to the opportunity that you didn't think you were ready for, you know? It's all timing. Like, looking back at it, I feel like I was ready by the time Rising Voices came along because I had been going through so much failure right before, you know? I was getting rejected by all these things. I was just, but I kept going. And I think, I think that that's what really, that's what's special about these opportunities. The big idea behind Rising Voice is that, you know, we had come up with this idea of of taking this money and 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 giving it to a bunch of people to to basically come up with their own vision. Um and it was it was Lena and Rishi from Hellman Grad who, you know, our original idea was we were gonna give twenty five thousand dollars to forty filmmakers and and they said, Well, you got the you got the denominator right, but um what you want is a big enough budget that somebody can do something that is actually going to be a demonstration of what their capabilities are and that this is that was Lena and Rishi's idea was that this is this is a calling card um and this is showing what you know on with with proper funding what you can really do and so the the, the budget was a hundred thousand plus there was the the COVID budget at that time so I think we had an additional twenty five thousand dollars just for all the protocols because people were still figuring out how to how to do this and do it safely this was before vaccinations and all of this other stuff um so can you talk about having, you know, having done all these things for free or for $300? What what was it like? What was different about being able to a- assemble the resources and the crew to 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 make this thing the way that that you really envisioned it? I think what was different was in terms of financials just being able to pay people and to know that I could really really use the full potential of the script the full potential of 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 the talents of the people I wanted to work with to to have access to that and see it through I think that was amazing because of it I mean no no matter how seasoned like you could be really seasoned unless you're like an Oscar winner it's really hard to get anything made you know and I think to be able to have the structure and the responsibility of like, we have this money, you know, we can't just, we can't cut corners. Not that I was already, but you really have to do everything by the book while also being able to be given an opportunity to really shine and succeed. I think that was incredible. And, you know, at first, I think I I was a little insecure about it. I was, obviously there's fear, there's responsibility there's anxiety of being like am I ready for this can I do this and I think it challenged me to to really walk the walk you know it it was like that defining moment for me almost like a coming of age of like you've been calling yourself like oh I'm starting to direct and I've been like saying it very like uh whispered in in, like groups and stuff and says like if I'm gonna call myself a director then I gotta, I gotta step up and I gotta do this. And, and, and for that, I, I, I hired the people that I know were going to help me do this. And, and that's also surrendering your ego a little bit and thinking who 
where where do I end and other people begin, you know? Who can I get on this project that I know will connect with me, will connect to the text and will want to make this the best thing ever? And and I think it was that it was like having that money to be like I want to be picky and I want to find the right collaborators and I don't want to settle for less. Um so yeah, it was it was beautiful. It was beautiful to 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 do that and to and to and to trust my gut and 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 to go for it. It was it and it clearly, you know, it paid off not just for me but for everyone, you know. I've never been surrounded by people that are you know like one one shared opportunity has I think changed the life of 10 people and even more people because it was also if you think about it like that my producers that are as Sundance they're getting calls now they're getting meetings they're my DP like people know who she is it, it was it's like you gave us the opportunity to give a opportunity to other people too and I think that's what the ch that chain reaction is really really cool we could talk a whole lot about um about that experience. What I, I'd love to um, just take a minute and talk about the movie itself um, because it is so unexpected and extraordinary and beautiful. And 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 the, the great thing for us was that we had this idea that if we just asked 10 people to do whatever that prompt meant to them, something about the meaning of work, um, we certainly weren't expecting Weya. Like the, the, that was, and, and so much of what came was so beautiful, but, but it's a singular take on that. And and um, we were talking before we started recording here that you just came through a weekend of Zooms where everyone asked you exactly the same question. What was the inspiration? So, uh, so I'm not going to ask you the same question or to, to ask you to give the same answer that you've been giving. But how do you, um, how I guess, how would you describe Weya to people that don't know anything about it? Ooh, that's a good one. I'll say two things. The first one, I think it's an emotional, sensorial journey um, through grief and the many layers of it. But I don't think it's about grief as you would expect it to be. It's not just about pain. It's about what comes after. It's about what comes before. It's about being in it in that moment too. It's about saying goodbye. It's about moving on. So I think there's there's a lot of layers there, um, but it, it is definitely a journey. To just my advice to anyone that wants to watch it would be, let let it take you. Just don't don't put too much in it. Let's just let it take you and see what happens. Hopefully you feel something. That's what I would want. Um, the other thing, and I'll tie it back to the meaning of work because. Though I didn't necessarily, what's funny enough, because I didn't write it for Indeed Raising Voices, I had it written, but I think it fits so much to this meaning of work that we talked about. And I think what's funny is that as the film has sort of traveled with me and my life has changed and I've changed, I have found that it talks about work in terms of passion versus labor and how those can intersect or those can be completely separate and how those can be defined by your generation or your socioeconomic background and and so many other th things and, and I just I'm very interested in that in in our relationship to work and and how to some work is is survival you know it's it to to most of my family you know it's to my grandparents, to my mom and my dad, it was just getting by and having, having, having to do it because we have to. And then, and then you come into passion and 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 career, and and what I'm doing now. And 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 I think, I would say a lot of, you know, my generation. That's sort of an inheritance, you know, that that's generational wealth to be able to dream and to be able to have a passion and, and that your work becomes passion and not just survival. And so I'm very aware of that now. And I think I was aware of it when I was filming, but as it's come, gone by, it sort of has fueled me to 
to really look at that intersection and where I stand and, and be able to to create opportunities where maybe work can also be passion for other people, you know? I love that idea of generational wealth, having more than one interpretation or definition. That's really beautiful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, there's so much to talk about and, and time is running short. I, can you just talk a little bit about... Um, What's happened to you since the premiere? So the you had this short period of time, you submitted this thing, you got the call back, and then you had to hit the ground and get these things produced and done in a matter of weeks. And then we had this amazing experience on a beautiful, perfect day in New York City in June on a huge screen with a bunch of people premiering all of these films together. Um, and And there's something about especially you know for me and for i think a lot of people at that point in the pandemic we hadn't been outside and you know that things had just started to open up again and to and to see these things on a huge screen with people um and then all the stuff that's happened since so can you can you talk a little bit about just what's happened to you since having um completed this work well yes the, the premiere at tribeca was incredible and then the short and you talked about this it was about having a calling card and really being like, this is what I can do with a budget. And people have reacted. I mean, since then, I, I obviously Sundance is a very big deal. Uh, but other than that, I've, I've gotten, well, I can't say what it is yet, but I'm, I'm directing something very cool for a big company that, we will all recognize in due time. But that was through sending my short and applying to a specific program. And it's, it's going to be very cool. Since then, as well, I've I've decided I'm going to turn Weya into a feature film. And we got a grant from Warner Media that we also applied to. And everything we applied to with the short, you know, and, and, and also like documentation for what I want the feature to look like. But it really is the short that is grabbing people because people, it makes a difference when you have something to show that that shows that you can work with a big crew and, and that really is, again, setting you up for success. And so that's happened. And I've just been, I got into a Sundance Fellowship that is doing sort of interdisciplinary work. And I'm doing the Indeed residency. And so it's been lovely and and. Also met, been meeting a bunch of really great people that are interested in potentially working together. And it's just been a way to come into the industry and, and, a, and a presentation of who I am that I feel really, really, really proud of. Because that's another thing. I think what's important for also anyone applying and just in general is that we. Re I felt like I really made the film I wanted to make. And I'm really grateful that we have that industry sort of studio exec experience with you all because you were giving us feedback and you were again wanting us to to just make this these films the best we could but also really really focused on having us put out our vision and i think that was very very valuable because people can see that people can see your heart people can see you in things and and that's when they connect so i, I feel like people can see me in this film and and that's what i'm most proud of i have this amazing opportunity to to work together um, in the residency program. And, and, and it's incredible how much stuff you have going on. So we feel actually at this point, really fortunate to get the opportunity to, to have your time as well. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, I think that we, that, that idea that I introduced at the beginning and that you've heard me say before of talent is universal opportunity is not, um, that we're really excited about this opportunity to work with you. And then Stacy and Johnson, who are the other, uh, members of the residency program, and we'll have them on this podcast as well at some point. While we haven't sat down and figured out exactly what it looks like, can you sort of talk a little bit about what what you what you're hoping, I guess, to get out of that experience to to collaborate with us and our marketing team and these other creatives, and then obviously with Lena and Rishi and and our great friends, Consendome uh, at Two Seven One Films, to to try to produce more work about this idea of the meaning of work? Well, I'm really, really excited about how work is become, it's changing. The, the, the relationship of work that we have with work is changing. 
So I'm, I'm interested in coming into it. I'm, I'm interested in, in what are the jobs of the future. I'm interested in, I'm interested in not feeling too young or too old. Because I think as someone who changed their career path and who's sort of the daughter of people that are like, you know, very hard workers and, 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 and like my, my grandma who, who's passed, but she was an orth- orthodontist and she barely retired. You know what I mean? I, I, she loved what she did. And, and yeah, I think I'm excited about unexpectedly showing the workforce and the people in it and their stories and, and our relationship to it and how, and how that's changing because we're changing because, because a pandemic happened because we maybe can work smarter and not harder. And how, how does that look like for everyone, you know, and how do we, I'm very passionate about um, protecting people in the workforce as someone who's part of a union too. I, I, that, that's important to me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm excited about all the possibilities, but the idea of work, and as you said, just taking that and, and showing a different perspective of that, I think, I think it's exciting to me. And just also working alongside Stacey and Johnson is very exciting as well because I think they're incredible filmmakers and people. So it should be really fun. Well, we're, we're excited too. Um, I always end these conversations with, uh, with the same question. And I, I think we've sort of heard so much already from you on this topic, but I'm going to ask it anyway, which is throughout the pandemic with all of the, the challenges and, and, uh, and everything that the, the world has faced, you know, what in that period and that time has left you feeling optimistic for the future? I think I feel like a lot of people in my life, are more honest about who they are after the pandemic. I feel I feel like that proximity to death and, and time and and the idea of like we only have one life I, has made a lot of people around me very aware of, of who they are and, and seeing other people walking in their power in and being authentic really inspires me. So I hope I hope we can all be honest with ourselves and I hope we can all have the opportunity to to be more of us and not so much of the noise of the outside world so that that gives me hope well that's a beautiful way to wrap up um Gabriela thank you so much for joining me today for this thank you so much for being a part of rising voices and being part of our development lab and thank you for this amazing art that you're bringing into the world Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me. Thank you for raising voices. And, you know, I hope this is the first of many talks that we have. 